Well, good morning. We're glad that you found us on the Valley Presbyterian Church's website. We're here to worship the Lord, and we uh, greet you and hope that all is well with you in these uh, trying days. It's probably good to see someone without a mask on. Uh, so we uh, welcome you. We're here to worship the Lord. And so we, we uh, have one announcement. Uh, Pastor Jason has been uh, giving us words of encouragement on Wednesdays and Fridays. And of course, this Saturday, Friday is Good Friday, and we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew anyway, so we thought we would have a, a short service uh, provided for you online uh, from Matthew's Gospel, and Pastor Jason will give the message, and I'll uh, assist him in uh, leading in time of, of liturgy, kind of a Vespers uh, Good Friday service. So we encourage you to, to tune in for that on, on Friday, as well as Easter Sunday next week. Well, let's be called to the worship of the Lord from uh, Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas. He established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Let's sing together, uh, crown him with many crowns. Let us pray together. 
Our Father and our God, you are the great uh, creator, uh, the sovereign orchestrator of all things, the, the source and giver of every good and perfect gift. And to you uh, be all glory and honor. And, and Father, we praise you for you have, have washed us, you've cleansed us, you've clothed us in Christ. You have seated us at your right hand in Christ in the heavenly places. And so we, we worship you uh, this day. We lift our hearts to you, our hands to you, our, our, our lips to you. The very words of our mouth, we pray they would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, to the Christians gathered because of God's love and grace, receive the Lord's greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Well, we confess our faith from uh, the book of Philippians, a beautiful hymn about the Lord Jesus Christ and his work of salvation uh, for us. Uh, reading Philippians 2, verse 6 through 11. Uh, people of God, what do you believe? Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The God we worship is known to be just, but he's also known to be a God of mercy and of grace. Understanding mercy and showing mercy is often difficult for us because we prefer that those who offend us get what they deserve. We develop a nature of harsh criticism and we want others to get what they have coming to them and then some. God, however, is merciful to even the worst of offenders. This means that even though he knows the depth of our sin, he doesn't always deal with us as our sins deserve. And since God has given us a merciful high priest in Christ his son, who can sympathize with our weaknesses and who has made satisfaction for our sins, God in his word encourages us to draw near to his throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy and grace in our time of need. This morning, we will corporately confess our sin and our need for God's mercy from our liturgy. Let us confess this together. God, be merciful to me. On thy grace, I rest my plea. Plenteous in compassion thou, blout out my transgressions now. Wash me, make me pure within. Cleanse me, O oh, cleanse me from my sin. My transgressions I confess, Grief and guilt my soul oppress. I have sinned against thy grace and provoked thee to thy face. I confess thy judgment just, speechless I thy mercy trust. Broken, humbled to thy dust, by thy wrath and judgment just. Let my contrite heart rejoice and in gladness hear thy voice. From my sins, O oh, hide thy face. Blot them out in boundless grace. Gracious God, my heart renew. Make my spirit right and true. 
Cast me not away from thee. Let thy spirit dwell in me. Thy salvation's joy impart. Steadfast make my willing heart. To those of you who have confessed your sins and are seeking God's mercy in Jesus, know that you have obtained mercy, not because we're deserving, but as God's free gift of grace in his son. Hear this for yourselves from God's word to you. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7 says this, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of our works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom we poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So having received this good news from God's word, let us respond with joyful praise. Um, from how deep the Father's love for us. Also found in your liturgy. How deep, how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Testament reading comes from uh, the book of Psalm, Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand against the rulers and gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. 
the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading comes from uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh, verses 15 through 23. Hear the word of the Lord. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So far the reading of God's word. Let us stand and sing Hosanna together. Father, we do come to you and ask that you would hear our prayers according to your goodness and your love for us in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that uh, you would be honored and glorified in our thoughts and minds and our hearts and our inmost being in all that we are. May we love you and want more to love you more. May we, Lord, respond to your love uh, and therefore crown you the King of kings and Lord of lords. For you are indeed that, without even loving us, you would be that. But all the more so because you have loved us in Christ and given us grace, we crown you King and Lord. Lord, we pray for these difficult times that your church is in throughout the world, that people in general are in, 
And Lord, we ask that you would hold back this pandemic. We pray that it would not be as bad as some predict. We pray, Lord, that you would use your church through it, that we would not dig a hole and hide, but that your church would uh, stand out and be the light that you've made us to be. Lord, show us how to do that in our conversations with others this week, uh, with our own attitudes and our own hearts, uh, with our love for one another and caring for one another and, and having this time of separation so that others may not get this disease. Lord, all this is a sh uh, showing forth of us wanting to love our neighbor because you've loved us so much in Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that your church would even be built up and would be strengthened, perhaps even in number, Lord, if that would be your will, throughout the world uh, because of this pandemic. May people more and more see that how frail they are and that uh, if their bodies are so frail, certainly our souls are as well. And Lord, that may there be a need in turning to you, uh, realizing how, how fearful it is that you to stand before you with our, uh, without uh, purity. And that purity comes in Christ, Lord, we know, but we stand only in you. Help people to see that. May there be a conviction throughout this land and throughout this world that uh, people need you and they need to find the Savior that you provided. And so we pray, Lord, that your church would be strengthened. We pray for uh, this local church, Valley Presbyterian Church, and all the people, uh, young and old, and all of us in different circumstances. Lord, may we continue to love one another uh, via a phone or other means of communication. May we not forget one another. May we care for one another, even in this separation. And so, Lord, we give you glory and praise. We know that your judgments are past finding out by us, and yet... They are holy and just, as your word says. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do a, a marvelous thing, a thing that would even surprise us, that would uh, call us to further praise and glory of you through these times. And so we ask this and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've come to the portion of our worship service where we worship God with our gifts. Just a reminder that you can give online by visiting our church website, valleypresbyterian.org. Go to the Give tab and scroll down to the bottom and you can make a donation that way. When it comes to giving, we are so often averse to giving because we're afraid that parting with our money will in some way impoverish us. However, God's word paints a whole different picture. It illustrates that it is our, to our advantage to do good to others. Proverbs 11.25 says, Whoever brings a blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. One commentator noted that the liberal soul that prays for the afflicted and provides for them, that scatters blessing with gracious lips and generous hands, that soul shall be made fat with true pleasure and enriched with more grace. So give as you're able during this difficult season, trusting that God will enable you to continue to be a blessing to his people.
I invite you to turn to Luke's gospel, the 19th chapter, as we uh, come before the Lord this morning and hear his word. In Luke's gospel, uh, since chapter 9, Jesus has been setting out toward Jerusalem, and he's been zigzagging across the countryside south uh, and ends up in uh, Jericho in the early part of chapter 19, where he brings Zacharias, uh, Zacchaeus' house uh, uh, and salvation to that house there in Jericho. And so this is, if you can imagine this, Jericho is about 25 miles from Jerusalem. It's on the river valley of the Jordan River. And so Jesus is ascending up this eastern slope of these uh, central uh, mountains in Israel. It's a steep st- slope, and he's approaching uh, Jerusalem from the east. And there is one, when he gets there, there's going to be one last hill that he has to go over called the Mount of Olives to go into Jerusalem. Jerusalem sits in kind of a bowl with hills around it, and the, the Mount of Olives on the eastern side of Jerusalem is uh, about 300 feet above Jerusalem, so it looks down upon the city. And Jesus is moving in that direction. And we're going to be told in this passage that he's in and around Bethany, where Lazarus was raised from the dead, and Bethphage, which is uh, unknown to us exactly where it is. It's uh, Jerome, one of the early church fathers, tells us uh, in the um, late uh, fifth and early sixth century that it was uh, uh, just west of Bethany. Uh, About 15 minute walk from Bethany today, you'll find a church there. I was able to visit that church and uh, it's uh, the place where the festivities today will start, uh, uh, a church there that's built upon uh, uh, middle, middle, middle Ages uh, type of uh, foundation of a, of a church that was there, and then there's a newer church built on top of it. But in that church is a stone, and the stone there is uh, said by tradition that be the stone that Jesus st- uh, stood upon and got on so he could get on his donkey. Of course, that was crusader talk because they had giant horses and uh, they needed assistance to mount those horses. Uh, Jesus wouldn't have needed much to get uh, placed upon a donkey. But it's interesting place there, right there, just about um, uh, a few uh, stones throw from the very top of the, of the uh, Mount of Olives. So Jesus is traveling and he's probably traveling with hundreds of people uh, as, as thousands of people swell into Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Sometimes the Jerusalem would swell up to six times its normal size. So many people are coming. And it's recorded as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. It's recorded in all four Gospels. Uh, but each of the Gospels has a certain uh, uh, emphasis. And Luke uh, doesn't actually even mention the entrance into Jerusalem itself. It's the entrance into the temple, which is in Jerusalem, that he mentions. It's uh, the temple there. Uh, he does also doesn't mention palm branches at all. Uh, he calls the crowd disciples, which is unusual for uh, the Gospels. But more importantly, Luke puts Jesus' entry in this triumphal entry right after a parable between uh, Zacchaeus' uh, salvation and the entrance and the triumphal entry is this parable of the ten uh, min- uh, minus, minuses. And so it, uh, those are minuses of a, uh, a type of coin to, uh, uh, that uh, was used. And so Mark and, and Matthew uh, put uh, the healing right after, or, or rather put a healing of Bartimaeus, the blind man, right before the triumphal entry. But Luke only puts this parable right there. And it's by no accident that he does that. Uh, this parable is a parable you might remember of the of a king going away to be crowned, and he leaves the the, the menace, the, his different uh, uh, statements of, of 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 wealth to his servants, and tells them to invest in it. It's very similar to the parable of the talents, and then but it's told there that the subjects, not the servants, but the subjects of the kingdom, uh, don't want him as king, and they uh, make that quite plain. And of course, it's a parallel to Jesus. Jesus is the king, the king who is unwanted by his own people. In fact, we'll see some criticism of Jesus by the Pharisees as I read this passage, only in Luke as well, by no coincidence. And so this parable parallels the procession into Jerusalem. 
One scholar put it this way, the triumphal procession is a historical commentary on the, the parable that Jesus has just told. And so this is the triumphal entry, but it's a triumphal entry with a, a large footnote that the celebration will not last long and that there are dark clouds on the horizon. But look and see, and, and, and as I read this to you, look for Jesus. Look to see who Jesus is because he's telling us by his actions and this story is telling us uh, who Jesus really is. So here's the word of the Lord. It's Luke uh, chapter 19, and we're going to be uh, uh, speaking uh, from, uh, uh, starting rather from verse 20, uh, 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent went and found it just as he had told them. As he, they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept for it and over it. And said, if you, even you, had only known on this day which would bring, what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you. And encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because, because all the people hung on his words. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we ask that you would help us now. You would strengthen us, open our hearts and minds to your word. May we hear it. May we meet you once again as you uh, give us your word. And as your word is, is brought to our minds and hearts Give us all that we need. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have all experienced uh, great appearances or great entrances in our lives. Uh, from sometimes the ridiculous entrances of a boxer coming into the ring for the championship fight. Or even worse, the wrestler who comes in with all his garb. Uh, to uh, a football team bursting out of the locker room onto the field. To, to a bride coming down. Uh, the aisle. Appearances, great entrances, have their impact upon us. And Jesus makes a great appearance here and a great entrance here. His entrance speaks. It says something to us. In fact, I would say it says it all about who he is. It is telling. It is striking. It describes Jesus in no uncertain terms. It is really an, a window uh, uh, of opening it up to us of who Jesus is. And I have three points for you this morning, uh, three windows, if you will. 
It shows us that Jesus is the rescuing king in verses 28 through 39. Secondly, it shows us the, he, that he is the compassionate prophet in verses 40 through 44. And then thirdly, it shows us he is the zealous priest, uh, verses 45 through 48. So first, the rescuing king. And the first scene we're given is of this finding the cult for Jesus to come into Jerusalem on. And this is not just an introduction to the story. We can sometimes read it that way. It's just kind of getting things started and set up so the main event can happen. But Jesus is really doing something by this and showing something by this. And of course, we ask the question, did Jesus predict this or, uh, uh, or did he plan it ahead of time about the cult? Uh, is the phrase, the Lord needs it, some type of code word or password uh, for the people to release the cult to his disciples? Or did Jesus know that it all happened just like this? Well, I don't really think it matters uh, one way or the other. Uh, both are possible. The point is that Jesus is uh, making everything and everything is under his control. Jesus is uh, uh, showing that he has this all planned out. It was all as Jesus said it would be, is what Luke tells us. And so Jesus is the Lord who needs the cult. Uh, Jesus, in a sense, is his, his cult, for he is the king of kings and the king who owns it all. And so what we're seeing in these early verses is showing us uh, that Jesus is king. Even it tells us that it was a cult that had never been ridden on before. Well, that's a cult that a, a, cult that a king would use. Kings have certain possessions that they and they only have. Uh, you think of a scepter or a crown. Uh, that's only for the king, and this cult was only for Jesus. Even them placing him upon the cult is reminiscent of, of enthronement, of putting someone there that is king. Or look at verse 36. The people, how do they respond? They put their cloaks before him. Why are they doing that? Well, certainly it's a, obviously a, a way of giving him honor. A person's cloak, uh, even your coat, would be as important to you, uh, uh, or a sweater. Uh, but even the cloaks of theirs, their, their outer cloaks were really important to them. But it goes back to 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13. When Jehu was crowned king, it says there that they spread under him their cloaks. It was a sign of putting something down for a king to pass over. Or look at verse 37. They lifted up their voices in joyful shouts. Well, what did it say in Zechariah 9.9? 9, that the king would come, that the, the, the riding on a donkey. And what would they do when he does come? Well, verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. That's how the people respond to Jesus as he comes in. And what do they shout? Verse 38. Blessed is he, uh, is the king who comes in the name of of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Those phrases should ring in our he heads from Luke's gospel, remember chapter two? It was the angels who said glory to God in the highest as they came to the shepherds. Luke is tying that in, that the, the, the king that was born uh, is now the king who is coming uh, there for him. And then look at uh, the phrase, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's taken from Psalm 118, where literally it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He, who's the he? The he in the context there is the pilgrim who's coming to the house of the Lord. But that's not what they say. They say, blessed is the king, that he is fulfilled in Christ as the king. And so Luke is the only one who uh, quotes that uh, from Psalm 118 that way to bring out the fact that Jesus is coming as king. And then we see that the, the Pharisees, of course, are bent out of shape because of this, because they understand what Jesus is doing. They hear it. They know, they get the point loud and clear. And so they're saying to Jesus, back it up, Jesus. Walk it back, Jesus. This is, is, is it's gone far enough. Uh, you're claiming to be the king, the, the Messiah, the anointed one. But Jesus won't do it, will he? 
If, if the people won't shout out, then the stones will shout out, Jesus says. And this is an interesting allusion. Uh, certainly, it, it, it's saying um, that Jesus is saying that, that, that if, if people don't praise him, if Israel won't praise him, then creation will step in. Uh, that's kind of the obvious meaning. But the less than obvious meaning goes back to the prophet Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 9, where it says, Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. The, the rich man puts his hope in wealth. It goes on and says, You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of woodwork will echo. That's the only time in the scriptures where stones are crying out. Jesus is alluding to this. He's saying that, that this is a phrase for the stones crying out is a phrase of judgment. If, if, the, if the Lord won't be acknowledged as king, then the stones will ride out. And Jesus as the king is not acknowledged, so the stones probably mentioning the stones of the, of the temple that they were now starting to go down and see as they go into Jerusalem. Those will cry out, Jesus must be received. He is the king. He's the king that day. He's the king today. And we as Americans uh, kind of uh, have a history, our history steeped in having no king, right? Uh, we uh, kind of could stumble over this. What does it mean for Jesus to be our king? We think of kings as being pompous or, or even useless figureheads or our worst despots who prey upon the weak and, and the oppressed. But the faithful king, the biblical king, the true king of Israel was a father to his people was a protector and a provider, a savior of the weak. We think of a king being one of an authority, and that certainly is what Jesus is, but it's more the thought of a savior than of one who is telling you what to do. The biblical king was to resemble God, who was the only true king and the only one who can provide. And this is the king that Jesus is. He comes to rescue his own, to shield them, to provide for them. By Jesus coming this way, he's saying, I'm your king, game on. Uh, I'm on my way, deliverance is on my way. I'm here to save you. But of course, Jesus doesn't save like other kings, does he? He saves like no other king could or would or has ever done before. He conquers, he defeats our enemies by being conquered. He takes our salvation and makes our salvation by giving in to those who are his enemies. He is the one who's, who's not making others die. Most kings make others die so they can conquer. But he does just the opposite. He dies himself and conquers. So Jesus is the king. And will you crown him today as king of your heart and life? Will you uh, respond and allow him to, to rescue you from your sin? Will you follow him as king and bring glory to him by using your talent, your, whatever he gives you for the, the glory of himself? Now you might think that in this time of, of crisis that the Lord is not king. We don't see him uh, healing people uh, right now. We don't see... Uh, we see the opposite. We see people dying around. But Jesus is still king. And Christian, he is still your king. And you, uh, but being the one who has him as king does not mean that you will not get this virus. And if you get this virus, it does not mean that you won't get sicker and have to go to the hospital. And being, uh, having Christ as your king doesn't mean that if you go to the hospital that you won't be put on a ventilator or that you won't die. So you ask, why do I want Jesus as my king? Well, you want him because there's something greater that threatens you than even this pandemic and this virus as deadly and as, as serious as it, as it is. And that's sin, our sin, our rebellion in our hearts against God. 
and Jesus will be your king and will rescue you. So on that final day, you will stand before him, clothed in his righteousness and all the things he has done to provide for you. He will take you under his, his, his uh, shield and, and, and protect you and provide for you. He's your king. And more than that, he will take you through the crisis and never leave you. Jesus is king. Crown him as king of your life today. Well, secondly, this morning, look at verses 41 through 44. Jesus is not only the rescuing king. Jesus is the compassionate, weeping prophet. There is a great emotional shift in the story here, isn't it? in there. The crowds are, are celebrating. It's noisy. They're shouting out praise to God. But Jesus stops and Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps because he sees the city. It's a magnificent view. If you've had, I hope you can go to Israel someday and see that. You come over this Mount this uh, this hill, the Mount of Olives, and then it's a steep incline. But before you, you see Jerusalem, and it was even greater then in Jesus' day as the temple was built, and it's higher up than the temple base today. And Jesus stops, and it's a magnificent scene. But Jesus' sight goes deeper than that. Uh, it goes further than that. I, I imagine some people would cry. If you've seen a great, magnificent thing that you've been wanting to see all your life and you see it, the tears come to our eyes. But Jesus sees deeper and he sees further. Literally, the Greek says here that Jesus burst into tears. He was sobbing there as everyone was celebrating. And he sobs because he sees the blindness of Israel their Messiah is finally here, and they can't see him. Peace is right at their doorstep, and they walk right over it. Jesus sees the days ahead for Israel. Jesus is, looks forward to 40 years from that time, to 70 AD, when the Romans would besiege Jerusalem, when 80,000 soldiers would surround the city for nearly six months. Josephus, uh, one writer of the first century, an eyewitness of this, says this. While the sanctuary was burning, uh, this is when the final days of this siege, neither pity for age or nor respect for rank was shown. On the contrary, children and old people, laity and priests alike were massacred. The emperor ordered the entire city and the temple to be razed to the ground leaving only the loftiest of the towers and the portion of the wall enclosing the city on the west, the Wailing Wall today, all the rest of the wall that surrounded the city was so completely raised to the ground as to leave future visitors to the spot no reason to believe that the city had ever been inhabited. In fact, Titus, who was in charge, the general there, when he finally came in and saw what had happened to the people inside the city, threw up his arms and said, uh, uttered a groan and called upon God to witness that it was not his doing. Now, of course it was, but he, he realizes what terrible things happened. Hundreds of thousands of people died in Jerusalem because of this. And the message should be loud and clear. It couldn't be more clear. Don't miss Jesus. He's the way for you to come to God. He is the way to find peace. He is your peace with God. John says, he came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet, to all, Jew or Gentile, today, who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become the children of God. But even if you won't come to him, he still weeps for you. He knew what was going to happen to Israel. He knew exactly how he would be rejected. And he still wept for them. For those he knew would turn away for, from him. He weeps for those who look right through him and pass him by. He takes no joy in the stubbornness of a heart or the unwillingness of unbelief. 
In fact, earlier in Luke's gospel in chapter 13, he said these words, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent you, how often I long to gather you, your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Oh, this morning, if you're passing Jesus by, call upon him to soften your heart, to open your heart to him. And more for the Christian who does own Jesus as king and knows that he speaks the very word of God. This is also not just a warning, but it is a, an encouragement. It is, it is a way by which we can follow him as king. Shouldn't we also weep for those who don't know the Lord? Jesus, notice Jesus doesn't say, it's their own dumb fault. They, didn't, they don't respond to me. I gave them every, every reason to believe in me. I did every miracle for them. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say they've been warned. He doesn't say they knew better. He weeps. He weeps for them. I remember James Boyce t telling a story of a, of a, a person in his congregation that was trying to reach out, I think after a service there at 10th Presbyterian Church to someone that was obviously um, not a believer and not living like a believer and living a life of sin. And, and, uh, and the person asked the, the woman, can, can, I, can I tell you about Jesus? And the woman said, no, I don't want to hear anything about Jesus. And he said, well, then can, can I pray for you? And she said, I, I guess if you, you want to. And he began to pray and pray for her salvation and pray that she would see the love of Christ. And he, as he prayed, he began to weep for her. And then he closed his prayer, thinking it was all over. And she said to him, you can tell me about Jesus. No man has ever wept for me before. The weeping of Jesus should touch our heart, that we would have a heart for the lost, and not just tell them because we have to or because Jesus has told them. That's a good enough reason in and of itself. But to tell them because, because they are lost and we're hurt for them. This is the Savior that we know. And so easy, it's easy for us who've been Christians a long time. The truth can make us harden to others. And we can start to say it's their own dumb fault. They, they, they know better. Oh, that we might follow Christ and weep for them. Well, thirdly and finally, Jesus is not only the rescuing king and the, the weeping, compassionate prophet, but he is the zealous priest. Look at verse 45 through 48. You need a little background for this. Um, the temple area uh, had these different courts and it went from the most inner court of the Holy of Holies where the high priest only went into once a year where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then it went into a what's called the holy place where the priests only went into and, and uh, tended to the altar there, the altar of incense and the table of shoe bread and the candles that were there. And then it kind of comes out again. And then there's a place where uh, those who offered sacrifices, which were the men, uh, uh, would come. And there was a place where all the sacrifices were, the court there. And then it goes even wider and women of Israel could come and worship in that court. And then it goes even wider to the court of the Gentiles, which is the largest era, court in area. And so the, the temple in Jesus' day uh, went uh, from, depending on which way you're doing it, inward to outward, but it also went upward because there were stairs at each of those court levels. And so it went up. And so you got the impression you were going inward. And this court of the Gentiles is the biggest court, and that's where Jesus goes. And people were selling things there. There was... Uh, extortion going on in these things. It was a den of robbers because at Passover time you'd come and, and you'd, the, the safest thing would do would be to buy your own Passover lamb there because it was kosher and it was the right one. And so you'd have to buy the lamb. So there's all kinds of animals in this court. And then uh, there was a half shekel that you had to pay as a tax. And so you had to get the right coinage for that and you had to uh, go to, to, the, to the bank, so to speak. So it was like a bank and a, a farmyard put together there. And the priests were making a handsome profit in all of this. In fact, 
the whole sacrificial temple was like a machine working. There was sacrifice after sacrifice, day on and day out. It was big business, particularly at feast days. And Jesus throws a clog in this machine. Jesus throws these, these people out. Something the priests should have done long before. It reminds us of Malachi 3, doesn't it? That he would come to peer into his temple and who could endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He comes to cleanse. And nothing is mentioned to us. I would want to know, how did Jesus do this? This must have been a multiple people, an animal, but Jesus put them all out. Was it their guilt that drove them out? Was it the command of Jesus? How did he do it? That's not told us. What we're given is what? Two passages, two quotations. One from Isaiah 56 that comes out of a context of a day when the Gentiles, the nations will come to the temple of the Lord and they'll be brought by the Lord to the temple of the Lord to fully take part in the worship of the Lord. Jesus is saying that the day is just around the corner for that. The day has come when the nations will have a chance to be a part of Israel. The nations must be able to hear and come and worship. This, this is what this temple is for, particularly when I'm here. And then he quotes Jeremiah 7, which is one of Jeremiah's famous sermons where he talks about the temple and how Israel is coming to the temple to hide out that they go off and they do their sin during the week and then they come back and to the temple and they hide there and they made it a den of robbers by doing that. And the temple was this place of worship for all nations. And how were they gonna do that? With coins clinking and doves fluttering and people haggling over money. It all had the sights and the sounds and even the smells of a, of a farmyard. It had to be stopped. Jesus stopped it. And Jesus is still the zealous priest today, seeking to cleanse God's temple, seeking to clear it so that his word can go forth to people. You say, but Ron, the, the temple's no longer there. It's been destroyed, as we talked about already in 70 AD. Well, Christ came as that very temple. He came to form a new temple from him, a temple of people in whom he would dwell. And the temple is now the church in Christ. The temple now is uh, your body, the scripture says. Your very body, Christian, is God's temple. And Jesus wants it cleansed. If Christ entered the outer court of your temple this morning, what would he find? What shouldn't be there? What would need to be driven out? What would need to be abandoned? Christian, we struggle with this. Certainly Christ as king and prophet, priest and king has the power to cleanse you. If he could drive out demons, if he could separate the greed from their money and their animals at this particular point in the temple, then certainly he can free you let that go. Whatever it is, give it up, whatever it is. He is your king. He is your priest who wants the best for you, wants you to be cleansed, wants you to be a temple holy unto him. He will do that. He is the one that can do that. Well, let's close together. If Jesus is not your king, then you're all on your own. You're you're standing before God one day with all your sin stuck to you and you can't separate yourself from it like sticky glue or something. And you will not fare any better than the Israelites fared in 70 AD. And that's why you need a protector. You need a healer. You need to be rescued. You need a vaccine for sin, an antidote for your sin. And Jesus is that antidote. Jesus is that rescuer. His death for sinners is your salvation, your vaccine. 
And you don't have to wait for it. You don't have to wait for someone to develop it for you. It's here today. Turn to this Savior right now. Ask him to be your prophet, priest, and king. The one who speaks the true words to you. The one that can cleanse you from all your sin. The one who can save you from the coming wrath. He is the blessed king coming for you. He is the blessed king. Come into that blessing. Come into his blessing. Come under his crown. And you will never regret it. You will always be his. You'll go on for eternity loving him and knowing him and enjoying him. Oh, that you may come to Christ even now. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, your word goes forth, but your spirit must take the word and, and show it to be what it truly is, true. And, and the, very, the very thing we need, the very salvation that we need. Lord, I pray for anyone who's not crowned Christ as their king and knows Christ as their Lord and, and, and priest and prophet. Lord, uh, draw them to yourself now. And for those of us who do crown you king, oh Lord, may we rejoice. May we shout out today in glory for what you've done for us. You've come to be our savior and you've done it for us. And you'll come for us again. Oh Lord, may we be encouraged even in these difficult days to know there are other days coming. Not just better days when a stock market may go up, but even greater days than that and we'll be going up to you and meeting you face to face. Oh Lord, we pray that you would strengthen your church now and cause us to see this story once again and to crown you as king. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you now. And God's people said, amen. <laughs>